Environmental, Social and Corporate Governance or ESG. These are the trendiest words in finance. Supporters say that being ethical and being profitable need not be mutually exclusive, benefiting stakeholders, society and the planet. But critics argue that these products are not that different from other investments and complain that it can be hard to measure whether a company is actually doing the right thing. So, is ESG just good branding? In the recent times, the impact of our day-to-day -day lives on the environment has been the center of attention. And that is affecting how investors allocate their money. There is this increasing understanding in society that we need to care about the climate, about social condition of employees and governance activities, which has shifted the focus of the investment management industry. Fintechs, on the other hand, have been closely connected with sustainability by offering easy access to financial services. Fintechs have directly contributed towards the social, economic, and environmental sustainability in various regions of the world by supporting small and big businesses that are closely tied to the regional and international context. While unbridled technologies, expansions, and unchecked industrial development may have proved to be unsustainable in the long run, Fintechs, on the other hand, offer a powerful foundation for sustainable finance towards urgent social, economic, and environmental goals. Without taking much of your time, I'd like to call upon stage Ms. Smita Hari, who has an extensive experience in ESG and climate strategy. Ms. Smita represents your Octus ESG, which is a global expert advisory firm facilitating global sustainable development and climate change transition. Ms. Smita's expertise lies in product structuring, financial analysis and research across financial services, clean energy and livelihood sectors. With a big round of applause, everyone, please welcome on stage Ms. Smita Hari. Thank you very much, Shubham, for that introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. I know it's in the middle of lunch, so uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. So before we jump into today's uh, topic you know, of sustainable finance and uh, fintechs, uh, let me take a minute to introduce what Octus uh, ESG does. Uh, so Octus is a global advisory firm in the uh, areas of sustainable finance, ESG, and climate strategy. And we work across markets in Asia, uh, Africa and Latin America. Uh, and we look at both the opportunities as well as the risk side of uh, sustainable finance and climate. So when I say opportunities, it is uh, designing innovative financial structures and mechanisms, uh, sustainable finance frameworks for bond issuances and such like. And on the risks, we look at climate risks, ESG risks, how they can be integrated into business models, uh, climate-related reporting and things like that. Uh, we also do a lot of, uh, you know, thought leadership, research reports, articles, kind of um, work. And one of the uh, so one of the research uh, activities we did was for Springer, uh, and uh, it was around, uh, you know, the role of financial institutions uh, in using uh, financial technologies for, um, you know, achieving sustainable development goals. And what was interesting to note is, you know, the similarity between sustainability and um, digitalization, so to say. So both have grown at an increasing pace. Uh, everybody seems to be talking about sustainability and digitalization. So it only makes sense, uh, therefore, to kind of use digital solutions uh, to achieve sustainable development goals, I would say. So the concept of sustainability has, you know, gotten increasing attention both at national and international levels. Uh, and uh, this is more so because climate change has become a very real thing. So in the next 50 years, uh, it is estimated that there will be significant economic loss because of climate change. India alone uh, is estimated to you know, face about $35 trillion loss if climate change is not uh, you know, looked at with a keen eye. And financial resources are central to this transition. And therefore, sustainable finance uh, needs to be done, um, I mean, looked at more creatively, more uh, innovatively, and also made it, uh, make it more you know, risk-proof, so to say, or at least less riskier than what it is today. So um, before we you know, get into the fintech aspect, I thought I'll just spend a couple of slides on sustainable finance. So 
as you can see on the slide, there are various terminologies associated with sustainable finance. So different definitions by different organizations. Uh, so you can see that the European Union, so Europe is where most of the action is when it comes to sustainable finance, has defined it as using ESG uh, in investment decision making. Within sustainable finance, there is green finance and within that there's climate finance. So even for these terms, it's not uniform. There are different uh, definitions, methodologies, termina terminologies, and mostly, uh, you know, because there's no universal definition, uh, organizations have started using this according to their motivations. So there is a proliferation of heterogeneous uh, terminologies for the term. But despite this confusion and chaos because of different terminologies, which could lead to greenwashing, you can see that there has been a tremendous growth in sustainable finance flows. So sustainable debt issuance has crossed the $1 trillion uh, mark in 2021. Green issuances, which is basically green bond, green debt, these kind of things, uh, that had crossed about half a trillion. And the non-green part, which is more to do with social uh, uh, aspects, has, was about 600 odd billion dollars. Recently, because of the war in Ukraine, most of the finance has been directed towards that from developed nations. But nevertheless, Q2 has been better than Q1, about 400 odd uh, billion dollars uh, in H1 of 2022 uh, towards sustainability. So the underlying fact is, because there is so much of flow, sustainable capital needs to be made more secure going forward. Now, while sustainable issuances are increasing, especially over the past two years, uh, more so with COVID coming into play, this is far from sufficient, you know, from addressing what is actually needed. So IMF's World Economic Outlook uh, says that over 50% of population is within these uh, LICs and LMICs, but actually only uh, about 15% of investments go into these countries. And there is tremendous need which is needed, you know, I mean, tremendous need which is there uh, in these countries to achieve the SDGs. Energy transition alone is over $2 trillion, that's what is estimated. And when we talk of climate finance, for climate resilience, climate adaptation, so to say, it's very, very fractional, you know, to what is required. So CPI had put out a report and it says that $630 billion is what is actually there as against close to $4 trillion. So you see, uh, there is a huge gap and this story is not very different in India also. About one fourth of or less than that is what is needed is actually there uh, in the markets. And another problem which emerging markets like India face is the high transaction cost. So essentially existing financing mechanisms which are there are not sufficient uh, even in terms of scale as well as in terms of the quality of investments to meet the sustainable development goals. So what are the challenges which are there, you know, uh, which are uh, uh, being faced because of, uh, to scale sustainable finance? Firstly, like I told you, there are multiple terminologies, but one step ahead, it's not just the multiple definitions, but also multiple methods of, you know, defining these things, multiple uh, processes which are involved. And because of this, you know, uh, countries have brought about something called taxonomies, sustainable finance taxonomy. So European Union has it, uh, China has it, the ASEAN region has it. But because the world is so interconnected these days, you know, and finance flows between the regions uh, is so dependent on what is, uh, what each other's economies are defining, there has to be some level of harmonization. The world is moving towards that, but we are not yet there. So that is a big challenge for especially uh, global capital flows towards sustainable finance. Uh, next is, you know, the demand for granular new and updated data. So data is a huge challenge when it comes to sustainable finance. So lack of reliability, lack of comparability between the data, uh, especially climate related data, because it's a very new uh, topic. Uh, across the world, people are learning about it. Uh, some regions are more advanced, but uh, nevertheless, there is a learning process. And therefore, data management is also going to get more, more cumbersome after, uh, you know, 
so many climate related disclosures sustainable finance disclosures are becoming mandatory so this is a huge challenge which sustainable finance is facing uh, again uh, the data related challenges are uh, exacerbated i would say by people not really being able to connect sustainability with the bottom line you know so making sustainability a business case is not something which is uh, widely accepted across uh, economy so yesterday i was i had attended the swedish ambassador's session and sweden is ahead of most countries for sustainability and there were some very interesting statistics which was there which uh, mentioned that uh, sweden looks at sustainability not because regulations ask them to or not because investors want to invest but because they want to make it a business case because they want to make their businesses competitive and that i think is a very um, interesting fact to pick off from such uh, markets where sustainability is way ahead of curve and uh, also in countries like india where transaction costs are very high you know especially for small ticket loans so the administrative certification reporting verification which comes with such kind of issuances is quite high uh, also you know because of the transaction costs are high sustainable finance issuances like green bonds etc are restricted largely to the uh, larger players you know uh, like uh, some of the bigger corporates in the country and not so much uh, the smaller players so how to make it inclusive is to bring down uh, transaction costs to make it more transparent and these uh, things like this so this brings me to the next slide on digital sustainability you know which largely can be used to uh, address most of the challenges i spoke about so what is digital sustainability it's basically leveraging technology uh, to further sustainable development so technologies like ai ml um, blockchain these kind of things to further sustainable development you know either financial or non financial and uh, improving sustainable outcomes accelerating climate action etc so there are a lot of models which have come up uh, within the fintech space within general uh, technology space to address these concerns so when i talk of digital sustainability there are two ways to look at this first is uh, using the technology itself to address sustainability issues right so for example climate related action using iot sensors for example in agriculture the other point is and usually not spoken about so much is how the technology is used you know so using carbon efficient ways in uh, in the back end for example so green data centers or green computing for example uh digital technologies can be used for a variety of uh, uh use cases which i will talk about shortly but when we talk of digital sustainability developing economies are more uh, these things are more relevant to de developing economies as well because we are hugely vulnerable to climate change and using such uh, such technologies can help very easily or rather uh, with a lot of uh, uh, you know um, uh prudence to kind of come up with solutions uh fintech has been one of the primary adopters obviously of cutting edge technology and i think the biggest advantage of fintech is uh financial inclusion and as all of you may agree uh that is uh something which is like on top of the list when we talk about advantages of applying digital technologies uh analyzing alternative data you know like utility bills uh other things like this can help in bringing people who are out of the formal financial uh, circle to come into uh, financial uh, uh, technologies uh, transparent data mapping and insights so this is another uh, huge advantage uh, which can be uh, used risk identification again when we talk of sustainable uh, finance risk is a very important component you know and many people do not understand how risks can be uh, addressed how risk can be analyzed in the first place and using uh, different kinds of uh, technologies different kind of models risk uh, climate risk identification is fast becoming a very important area where people are focusing on and uh, the other thing is on scale so obviously because digitalization is uh, not constrained by geographical borders uh, enhancing sustainability is possible because of you know achieving uh, large scale outcomes so to say 
and uh, finally reducing footprint so this is a very obvious um, um, relatable thing made, you know because it's paperless because branchless uh, carbon footprint is coming down although there is an ongoing debate about fintech sectors uh, impacts of using large scale energy e waste etc but again using renewable energy sources for this being more transparent and like i sp uh, spoke about using you know uh, energy efficient mechanisms these can be uh, good ways of you know addressing this so the evident gaps in sustainable financing uh, can be bridged using fintech which offers innovative solutions to scale up you know sustainable finance uh, very quickly, I just wanted to touch upon some global developments when we talk of uh, sustainable finance and uh, fintech. Uh, so some uh, key markets across the world, so Mauritius, for example, uh, highly vulnerable to climate change, and therefore the government has uh, realized the importance of increasing finance flows to climate adaptation as well as looking at digitalization. So that nexus has, so they have, uh, you know, set up open labs, fintech innovation labs, these kind of things. India is also recognized as a strong fintech hub as evidenced by the presence today, thousands and thousands of people. But, uh, you know, so Give City, for example, their, uh, you know, in incentives and established frameworks uh, can, uh, you know, attract more fintechs in the sustainable finance space. Uh, as recent as last week, Monetary Authority of Singapore, for example, has kind of revamped its financial strategy, uh, of which climate change and digitalization are very key to the whole, uh, you know, strategy. So you see, across the world, there is action on fintech and sustainable finance, and many cases, many countries are talking of both, uh, you know, in sync. Now, as we saw earlier, uh, the gaps that are observed in sustainable finance flows, uh, you know, can be addressed effectively, offering transparency and robust data uh, measurement, you know, while re reducing transactional costs. So just wanted to spend some uh, time on this slide, which talks about the technologies and the uh, products which have been out there in the market, and many more are uh, there. So blockchain, for example, you know, uh, it's like a, you know that it's a di digital ledger of information. So how can it be used uh, when you contextualize it with sustainable finance products? So that's what I want to try and bring out in this slide. So green utility tokens, for example, when we talk of carbon markets, you know, uh, carbon credits, for example, uh, tokenized carbon credits can be created using blockchain. So this is basically the registries have complete data, complete transparent information which is easy for uh, you know buyers of such offsets to track from where the uh, carbon credits have been generated and uh, complete information around that using blockchain. Uh, another example is tokenized biodiversity offsets. So uh, you know there was a case in point in Australia, which is by uh, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia and Biodiversity Solutions Australia wherein they kind of uh, did an innovative product around ecosystem protection. So the landowners in New South Wales, they were able to, you know, the biodiversity credits which were generated, uh, they could trade that in the blockchain marketplace. And uh, people, or rather the larger developers, larger corporates who wanted to offset their carbon footprint could purchase these uh, off uh, biodiversity offsets to kind of negate that. So that was a very innovative product. Next, when we talk of APIs, so as you know, there are bridges between different uh, programs. So mostly, you know, we can relate this to digital payment solutions when we talk of a sustainable finance uh, uh, in context. So for example, there is a fintech called Dokonomi, where the carbon, um, so when you, when you transact on that app, uh, the app throws up what would be your carbon footprint, you know, carbon emissions at transaction level. So they are tracked and they are reported to the user. And also there is a recommendation of how this can be offset. Uh, so more from a consumer behavior standpoint. Uh, another example is digital uh, crowdfunding platforms where, you know, a large number of individuals uh, can actually contribute to raising funds. And uh, Raise Now, which is a Swiss fintech, has done this for NGOs, nonprofits. Uh, of course, there are a lot of examples on crowdfunding, but this uh, specific uh, fintech kind of stores and tracks data 
uh, and you know uh, maps it to the outcomes of the uh, the funds which have been raised next on uh, artificial intelligence you know so ai and ml uh, i mean data being the cornerstone of fintech applications ai ml everybody ev almost every fintech uses it uh, but uh, you know this when you contextualize it again to sustainable finance products um, lending decision making customer support fraud detection uh, climate risk uh, detection these kind of um, uh, applications are very uh, can be uh, uh, so can be related to this so for example uh, regulatory technology so that is something which is fast coming up uh, with all the regulations around sustainable finance climate etc especially in europe so green reg tech is what uh, the term that is being used and uh, this enables so technology enables innovation to kind of uh, say for example in eu uh, you know uh, track the funds or the companies alignment with eu taxonomy so eu taxonomy basically defines what is green and what is not green you know so the activities which is being done by the companies can be tracked to align with uh, the EU taxonomy. So Greenomi is a Belgium-based uh, fintech firm which uh, does something uh, of what I just told. So aligning it with the taxonomy. So soon when India also comes up with these regulations, India has already come up with the BRSR and the RBI has put out the climate risks paper. So increasingly banks will need to kind of uh, start using such fintech applications to track their performance in alignment with the regulatory uh, scene which is happening in the country uh, green investment solutions are another uh, uh, kind of uh, financial product where investments are done in green sectors with little or no human intervention uh, green digital loans is on the other side where loans are given for green projects uh, and um, there are many fintech apps which kind of uh, facilitate such uh, loans uh, for example uh, there is a, a fintech called hema which is in the green mortgage space so tying up with a bank uh, for a loan for a green mortgage loan so basically smart buildings and green housing etc so the app actually tracks how the performance is on the green side and reports to the uh, bank which gives the loan and the bank in turn you know aligns that with the uh, eu taxonomy or whichever uh, taxonomy it is uh, under so this particular firm was in um, eu and therefore uh, eu taxonomy and finally uh, iot or internet of things so this is uh, like you know interconnected devices over the wireless and uh, again here insurance uh, is a, a fast growing space in, insure tech so to say and very relevant when we talk of climate risks insurance because insurance is a very uh, relevant sector hard hit by climate uh, impacts across the world and uh, so flood flash for example is a fintech which does a parametric insurance product uh, along with munich re which is the reinsurer so they have created a platform which looks at uh, algorithm based models uh, to pay out catastrophic flood claims uh, within 48 hours or within 24 hours i'm not sure of the number so within a very quick time uh, as soon as the loss is incurred uh, so these are some of the products i wanted to touch upon and uh, the next couple of slides i just wanted to look at uh, two critical aspects of fintech and sustainability one was how sustainable finance for flows can be scaled uh, using fintech and the other one is on the climate uh, how climate impacts can be alleviated using fintech so first on the sustainable finance flows how they can be uh, or rather how fintech is helping in scaling such uh, finance flows so like i mentioned earlier data has been uh, one of the biggest challenges when it comes to um, sustainable finance and uh, bond issuances for example uh, sustainable bond issuances especially sustainable linked bonds so what are sustainable linked bonds basically the coupon of the bond is linked to achieving the sustainable outcome and therefore it becomes very important for the issuer to measure these sustainable outcomes reliably so that the investor can uh, accordingly be accordingly can track it and uh, this is where uh, from an issuer's perspective you know fintech solutions uh, are very helpful uh, in aligning to taxonomies as well as in uh, kind of measuring these impacts which are out there and from an investor's perspective because they invest across different companies uh, you know comparing the data comparing how uh, 
different investments. And when there is a large, uh, large data pool which is there, uh, solutions, digital solutions can help in uh, effectively doing this. Uh, next is around you know uh, risk mapping. So again, like I told you, uh, allocating green capital based on uh, uh, you know transparent systems, based on proofs, uh, is very uh, important. And it's very, uh, it's fintech is a very important solution to this challenge which is there. Uh, small ticket loans typically have high transaction costs, and therefore banks do not touch it. Uh, so looking at uh, fintech solutions is one way of increasing finance flows, uh, which we are which we are seeing it's booming across uh, many markets. Uh, so this is like a very straightforward uh, uh, benefit which we are seeing. Uh, again, using blockchain for green capital raising. So basically helping in MRV uh, monitoring, reporting, verification activities, so to say. Uh, one other thing, when unique thing when it comes to sustainable investments is they are typically long term because the nature of sustainable interventions is long term. So long term investments needing the investor to stay locked in for a longer period of time, typically making it illiquid. Uh, so tokenization, which uh, I spoke about in the previous slide, is uh, it's a very uh, unique way of kind of unlocking that uh, liquidity and making it more liquid for investors. So there is a platform called uh, Liquid Token, which works with asset owners and offers liquidity opportunities for such um, asset owners. Uh, blockchain tokenization is also very, uh, it's a good way of kind of unlocking capital to smallholders, you know, smallholder farmers, for example, uh, where it's um, traditionally it's difficult to raise capital for such small uh, holder farmers and using uh, blockchain technology, it's easier to uh, raise capital. And finally, technologies like uh, AI, you know, because using it for data collection, data st streamlining, etc. Uh, for institutions like microfinance institutions, which work on the ground with the bottom of the pyramid, uh, which will help in uh, scaling, you know, uh, finance flows. So, just wanted to touch upon a case study in this respect. So, Ethic Hub, which is a Spain-based fintech, uh, was one of the pioneers in, you know, decentralized finance, so to say. Uh, which is uh, so basically what this fintech does it is it, it uh, connects farmers. Uh, from two aspects. One is on the lending aspects because farmers typically need money to, uh, you know, for their activities, whatever. So uh, from a lending perspective, from a financial perspective, as well as from market linkages perspective. So there are two things which this uh, app does. And uh, so it works typically on a crowd lending, P2P kind of a platform. Uh, connecting, uh, so you can invest either through cryptocurrencies or through a bank account which is linked to the uh, app. And uh, there is also something called smart contract. So when you lend for a particular intervention, a smart contract is typically generated which is you know built into the lines of code. So there is transparency and more reliability for me as an investor when I uh, you know invest. Uh, so you know basically uh, these kind of examples kind of scale uh, sustainable finance. Uh, in this, of course, there are numerous examples. This is just one, one, in, one point in case. But this, I picked this up because uh, there's a finance angle as well as there's an angle of you know, market linkages, which is very important for uh, you know, uh, someone like a, a, a smallholder farmer uh, to reliably so sell the produce which is being produced. Uh, the next couple of slides, I again want to talk about uh, you know, climate change, uh, which I spoke about. So climate change is a huge challenge uh, across the world more so for vulnerable countries, developing countries, because we have uh, you know, uh, lesser means of coping up with the climate impacts. And uh, climate fintech therefore serves as a crucial intermediary you know, in this respect. Uh, so in terms of, uh, so there are of course different use cases when we talk of climate impacts, but uh, not just in mobilizing capital uh, for climate interventions, but also change in customer behavior, consumer behavior. So that is fast happening uh, across the world. Uh, so right from you know, carbon offsetting, carbon accounting, uh, climate related disclosures, raising climate, um, climate finance, uh, there, there was an interesting model which I came across by Ant Forest. So basically, they combine gamification with, uh, you know, planting trees, for example. Uh, so very unique models, uh, so to say. And um, uh, 
uh, one very uh, interesting, uh, you know, what should I say, parallel to sustainable finance is around the insurance space. So there is a fintech called uh, Celsius Pro, which is an insure tech company, which kind of builds in index insurance solutions for physical climate risks. You know, so basically the payout is linked to, so the data is sourced from different uh, agencies and the payout is linked to the data which is provided and not so much on the proof of uh, loss which is happening. Uh, so transitioning to a low carbon economy uh, basically requires transparent mapping of risks and opportunities and FinTech can help in, you know, achieving this. Uh, so, there were so many other technologies which I had discussed earlier, uh, many of them liaisoning with, uh, you know, aligning with the climate, uh, grave climate impacts which are being faced. Uh, so this example which, uh, case study which I wanted to highlight is uh, on, on, you know, climate related uh, uh, fintech, but I, I, I mean I'm not sure how it's pron pronounced, I think it's Pisi. But uh, so this was a blockchain, uh, this is a blockchain based platform which allows retail investors to participate in, uh, you know, climate projects, I mean, renewable energy projects. So either solar projects or, you know, EV kind of interventions. So usually these kind of uh, uh, investments are more uh, available for institutional investors or high net worth in, in, uh, investors. So retail investors like you and me cannot actually go and invest in a solar project. But uh, this fintech has enabled that. So again, it is uh, so as low as 50,000 you can put in and you can get a fractional share of the project. So each project is housed inside a uh, SPV, a special purpose vehicle, which in turn, you know, it's, it's like an LLP and that uh, enters into a uh, PPA with a client, you know, for off-taking the uh, renewable energy which is produced. So it is very much like a traditional renewable uh, energy project, but instead of having institutional investors, retail investors can also be a part of uh, it. And there is a, uh, you know, a fixed monthly return you get into your wallet, which is maintained with the fintech, uh, which can be a return for the investments you make. And uh, the firm, uh, the fintech undergoes, uh, undertakes due diligence, risk management frameworks, etc., because they are kind of responsible for the investors who are putting in the money. Uh, and another angle to this is, so they basically let you know how much of carbon offsets are there. So from a personal carbon footprint uh, perspective, you can know how much of offset you are investing in, uh, which is uh, which the firm actually uh, gives out in the app. So this was a very unique model I wanted to, so this basically addresses the climate mitigation part, you know, in terms of uh, using renewable energy to uh, address climate uh, impact. Uh, so finally, my last slide is basically around the opportunities and the way forward. So given the increasing pace, you know, in which sustainability as well as digitalization dialogues are uh, happening across the world, uh, I think it's very important to look at the opportunities which this nexus is uh, presents actually. So uh, one uh, one key finding which we uh, which we had found was like you know uh, a lot of it depends on how much the consumer is actually aware. So there are a lot of payment apps, for example, which uh, report to the consumer what is the carbon footprint, for example, because of a purchase. So designing products around customer, uh, individual customer experiences, customer needs uh, is going to be very uh, important. And uh, SDG monitoring, you know, sustainable development goals monitoring is, is it's quite a complex process because it is, uh, you know, it kind of uh, overarches different technologies. So using different technologies to, you know, which can talk to each other and, um, uh, you know, having partnerships are, is actually crucial. So sustainability as a concept itself works well when there are a lot of partnerships. And uh, when you throw in technology, there is all the more need to kind of see how can, uh, you know, how can there be a mix and match uh, to get the uh, desired impact. Again, product innovations is very important. Uh, we see a huge number of different kinds of fintech products which are available, uh, but especially for the bottom of the pyramid because um, that's where the need is um, most felt, uh, but you know, instead of, so while there are product innovations, I think 
cross-sectoral product innovations is very important. So for example, a couple of, a few years back, a large private sector bank had come up with an app uh, which kind of, uh, you know, uh, works along with the, a tech company, the government, uh, from a subsidies angle. And there is a wallet-linked wallet application for uh, basically uh, sanitary napkins. So the sanitary manufacturer, napkin manufacturer immediately can know what is the demand from the NGO and the subsidy automatically kicks in. So it's all very transparent and uh, transactional and there is no subjectivity involved. So such kind of innovations for the bottom of the pyramid. So basically this uh, kind of helped uh, about 20 million rural women and children uh, for towards uh, uh, menstrual hygiene. So this was a very unique product which had, it, it, it was an Indian bank which came up with this. Uh, the other thing was on, uh, you know, calculating internal footprint. So greening internal operations is kind of becoming very important, uh, not only in fintech across different markets, uh, and with increasing uh, climate change impacts and talk about sustainability, I think looking at greening internal operations of fintechs uh, is very important because that, that is like the next uh, step. And finally, uh, businesses have traditionally focused on risks and returns, uh, but having a risk return impact model within the business model, uh, aligning it within the business core business strategy is, um, uh, will be the way forward. And uh, towards this, you know, a lot will depend on how policymakers, banks, uh, the, the government, fintech providers uh, come together and in a multi-stakeholder platform to kind of uh, take it forward. Uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening patiently and uh, happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Smita, for this informative presentation. And I'd like uh, now open like to, I'd like to open for uh, Q&A now. Uh, can we roll the mic in there? So there are different models. So what I was trying to say is uh, models where, uh, you know, so for example, if you uh, make a payment or if you make a purchase, for example, how much of your uh, carbon, uh, how much, what is the carbon footprint of your transaction? So there are apps which track that and report back to the user. And also there are some cases where offsets are suggested, you know, recommendations around what can be done to offset that uh, carbon footprint. So maybe you can, you know, do X, Y, Z kind of thing. So, yeah, that's it. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. So, on, uh, on the SKU level data, right, which is needed to assess and analyze that how much carbon footprint or the contribution is done based on the purchases which are made. Mm -hmm. For example, travel or food or any specific uh, purchases made by a specific user. So, that app, uh, how can they get, get the access to the SKU level data? So I think, see, I don't know how it's actually working because I'm also an external party. But from what I understood, it, I think, uh, so there was one example where the app had tied up with, a, this was, I think, in the UK or the US, I'm not sure, with, a, uh, with a, an offline store. And they facilitated purchase. So it was like a multi-product kind of store. So you can purchase through the app from the store. And the, f the store will give that information to the app you know, to kind of, so there are different models, but this was one, well, yeah. Yeah, so I think what you're telling is more complex at different levels, because uh, if it is across different uh, portals, then aggregating that data will be a challenge. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's, it's challenging, yes. <clears throat> Any other questions? No? I think it's Mita, that's it. Thank you very, very much. Once again, everybody, a round of applause for our presenter, please. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah.